Welcome back to our second episode of the Farm RPG Podcast. I am your host, Belligan. In this episode, we have a player spotlight with Code Ranger. That is followed up with an in-depth discussion with Augie about player interaction with moderators and staff. We wrap things up with a detailed discussion about drop rates again with Code Ranger. Hope you enjoy. We are here today with Code Ranger for our player spotlight. So we've got a couple of questions we're going to ask Code Ranger to get to know him a little bit better. And the first question is, how did you learn about Farm RPG and how long have you been playing? So it was completely random. I was uh, looking at the Apple App Store and they it popped up with the games you might like, you know, based on other things you've played. And it had a thing called Farm RPG. And I figured, sure, I like, you know, Harvest Moon and Stardew Valley and it looked kind of idle clickery and I like those. So I, I gave it a shot and uh, I've been around ever since. That was around uh, just just before Thanksgiving last year, right around the time Raptors dropped, I think. Seems like we have a lot of players that have joined from seeing those iOS reviews and having it be uh, recommended. That's that's cool to see the, the game grow that way. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they're, uh, they're complete nonsense, but in this case, it worked out quite nicely for me. Awesome. Well, if you had one sentence and only one sentence to describe what farm RPG is, how would you describe it? Uh, okay, so my my best effort, a multiplayer farming-themed RPG in the tradition of Fallen London and Urban Dead. I realize that referencing other games is kind of cheating, but it's the best I could do in one sentence. I'm going to be honest, I'm not familiar with with either of those two, but... Uh... They're, they're the same, <laughs> same general idea, like highly systematized, very text-driven, um, you know, very sort of you know, you're you're getting story through the through the mechanics to a large extent. Um, mm-hmm. Very very different thematically, but in terms of like the mechanics of the game, I feel like they they're fairly similar. Urban did is is a bit more competitive, but it's got the the same sort of simple text based interface to a large extent. Yeah, I don't think we see a lot of steampunk farming games <laughs> theme wise. There should be more. All right. Well, maybe there will be in the future. We'll see how many spinoffs we get from Farm RPG. <laughs> Next question: Where did the uh, your username come from? So, uh, C- Code Ranger started life as my GeoCities username, uh, so that would have been in right around 1998, I think, uh, and I've just mm-hmm. stuck with it ever since. My very vague memory, because this was many years ago, I think I wanted Code Man, uh, and the the sign up form said that was taken, but they had one of those like, you know auto recommend a related username and it said code ranger and i was like eh, sure that sounds fine and clicked sign up uh and like i said i've stuck with it ever since that's awesome i love it when we have usernames that comes from the 90s that's about uh, the era of mine as well well in addition to farm rpg and maybe some of the other games that you had listed uh what games do you like to play uh so like like a lot of other people in farm rpg melvor idol uh big big fan of that although i'm i'm stuck in mastery grinds there which is even more excruciating than farm rpg mastery grinds uh kingdom of loathing also a fan of that when i remember to run my daily automation um and I play a fair amount of online board games as a, just a way to to be social friends. Um, and especially lately, I've been playing a lot of Ur, which I really enjoy. It's a board game that was created about 4,000 years ago. Uh, and there's some really good online versions of it. Extremely simple, but really in, like really in-depth strategy-wise mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of fun. Outside of electronic games, is there any, anything you like to play? Uh, I mean, I have, uh, I have lots of physical board games, although COVID times make those... A little bit more difficult to to get out. The challenge to get a group of people together. Yeah, not anything I mean, right now, definitely. It was it was already difficult at the best of times with uh, a lot of people. You know, more and more, of my friends have kids, and it's uh, it's it's hard to get a big group together these days, even without the the plague spreading across the land. That is adult life. Is responsibilities get in the way of your fun? Yeah, sometimes. So it goes. But I'm glad that we have uh, we have good online versions of a lot of things. I, uh, I've also been doing uh, online wingspan lately with some friends. Very cool. All right. So the next two questions, I've had some people complain to the same thing, but there there's a nuance between them. Uh, the first one is tell us an interesting fact about yourself. Uh, the, the most interesting I can come up with that isn't completely incomprehensible uh, is that I used to actually work on video games a long, long time ago. Uh, I wrote the the Champions Online and Star Trek Online launcher and patcher, and I worked on infrastructure tools for uh, Neverwinter and a bunch of other games that Atari published mm-hmm. back when I was working there. That's pretty cool. It's a weird place, uh, but I do like the games industry. 
All right. And then our last question for the player spotlight. Is there anything else you'd like to share about yourself or something that you wish the farm RPG community knew? I think I think the, the biggest one is just I'm always uh, happy to share with any of my data analysis stuff, drop rates, questions about mechanics. Uh, you know, we're going to I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with Logan more about those here. So stay tuned for, for more of that. But if anyone ever has any questions, feel free to drop me a DM in game on Discord anywhere. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's start off with interaction with the the moderator team. So we know this can be a challenge for players when you've got a community that's very diverse from all around the world, vastly different maturity levels. And uh, it seems like we have a a large contingency of people that really struggle with any kind of authority. And I I say that uh, with the best intent possible, because I live with a bunch of people that are like that in my own household. Mm-hmm. I understand it very well. Yep. So you kind of gave an example of this, but when you as a player do something and a moderator steps in, I should react to that. I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, it also kind of depends on what you're doing and why you did it. You know, intent has a lot of, you know, intent gives a lot of our reasoning for stepping in. If somebody just posts in all caps and we say, hey, watch the caps and we delete the message. Oh, okay, sorry. You know, if just, you know, don't be a jerk to us. It's like, you know, if you're if you're still a student and you're, you know, you're cutting up in class. That's a Southern term that I learned when I moved here, by the way. It just means, you know, being an overall, you know, dingus or whatever. Um, and you And you get redirected. Just say okay and move along. Like it ain't, it's it's not that deep until you make it be that deep. Like if generally if we hand out a chat ban, we send a message, and if a player is generally well receptive and cooperative, we remove the chat ban early. I've had an hour chat ban last three minutes before because you know they they're like oh you know I'm sorry and it's kind of explaining where they're coming from. And also, we're not perfect, so we may misread a situation where I get a message saying, hey, a spoiler chat is going absolutely insane. I come in, I don't have time to see the full context because I'm trying to not have the chat be insane. So I tell people to stop. They may not see my message right away, and I keep going. So I hand out a chat band, and they're like, you know, yo, what's wrong with you? Did you, do you not even see I was just defending myself? Y'all ain't giving me the chance to see any of that because y'all ain't stopping. You know, it's like we really try to be as, you know, as impartial and unbiased as we can, you know, regardless of how many times a player has done things that uh, warrant our special attention. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's once or a hundred times, ideally it's not a hundred times. Please don't be that person. But, you know, we just don't, you know, if you... Like going back to, you know, if you're at school or you're at work and you're doing something you're not supposed to and you get told to knock it off or you get a consequence, you're not going to go to your teacher or your boss and be like, yo, man, F you, you know, F this, y'all are a whole bunch of power hungry, blah, blah, blah. Because what's that going to do? That's just going to either get you fired or get you, you know, get you suspended or whatever. Like, why do that with us? Like, It is not that deep, I promise. I think that's my biggest thing to say is like, it is not that deep. Just chill. Sometimes we give people chat bans because they're mad and they need to cool off. And we understand that, but they don't understand that. Yeah, I think you hit on a... a, Get some interesting messages. On a really good point. When When we get called into a channel, it's like you walk in a room and everybody's throwing fists. So what do you do? Well, you shut down the people that look like they're the most problematic. You don't have a chance to figure out what they're bickering out until until later right to go over yeah check out the logs and backtrack so if that happens as you said it's not because it may be because you're the person who's at fault but it may not be maybe just you're caught in the middle of it we'll figure it out it's all right be patient yeah be patient and give us time and like you know and you know if you feel like you need to explain something you know feel free to explain it but you know do it kindly or you know if you're upset you can be upset but you can still be respectful like, I am always respectful to players, even if they really, you know, are not respectful to me. Because, you know, as, as staff, 
that's an expectation. And ideally, as players, it's also an expectation, but it's not always for some reason. But, you know, like, I get some really crazy messages sometimes from people that are just mad about the fact that they could not chill. Yep, (laughs) that can happen. So what kind of tips could you give our players if they see something or see a situation where players are clearly not following the code of conduct, whether that's talking in chat or something else nefarious, maybe they're breaking some other rules and playing the game in a way that's not supposed to or using an exploit. What would, what would your advice to those players be? Just mess, like, just let, let one of us know privately. Um, don't try to call it out in chat because a lot of times that creates more trouble and it, you know, we don't want the trouble. We don't want an innocent bystander to get caught in the crossfire. If it is a serious situation Um, you know, if it doesn't concern you, you don't need to insert yourself into it, but you know, you can definitely reach out to us. Um, ideally someone who's online, even if it's someone who's not online, um, you can always message a ranger and, you know, we can step in and deal with it. If we are already involved in chat and something crazy is going on, um, you know, whether you were involved in it or not usually it's a good idea to back off the topic so that we can, you know, diffuse the situation and handle it privately. We handle most things privately because it's a privacy thing. And it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's just like ugly to try to moderate in public, like in the chats. Like we're not going to explain everything that we do to everybody because it's not everybody's business, you know, to put it bluntly. It's not your business why... You know, Susie got a chat ban because you don't know the full story. Susie might tell you one thing, but if she got a chat ban, that's probably not the whole story because, you know, we don't hand them out like candy. Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, I mean, when st- I mean, when stuff is going down, I like I don't throw out the ban hammer much. But when I do, it's because chat's on fire. And I just come in swing and I'm like, if y'all don't stop, I'm going to give you a full day to, ch- to think about it. So stop. And there, I mean, there have been times where like they would not stop. And I've had to do that. And it's not fun. That's not fun for anybody. You don't want a chat ban. We don't, we don't want to give out chat bans. We don't want to have to give out chat bans, I should say. Yep. But, you know, we do what we have to do. And uh, like, if, if you can't chill, it's going to happen. <laughs> All right. So what I'm hearing is the best advice is to keep it private. Message one of the staff members, let them know what's going on. I'll probably add to that. If you can get screenshots of specifically what's going on, that helps. It saves us from, from uh, sorting through a lot of logs. Yeah. And to figure out what, what the issue is. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of times, like if I'm sitting in trade chat, as I do, um, I'll get like a, pro- like a message from a player saying, hey, global chat's, you know, got an issue or spoilers chat has got an issue right now. So, you know, I pop over because they know I'm already online. I'm already going to see. But yeah, having context would be helpful. Um, just, you know, so that we can know, know what fire we're going to walk into. Because sometimes it's not too bad. It's just people kind of arguing about the way that something is was done. But sometimes there's like personal attacks going on. And I am I am not about that at all. Don't be mean. Don't be rude. It's ugly. But yeah, All so right. uh, let That's us advice. let us know, and uh, you know if you want if you want to do something helpful when people are not following the rules in terms of the chat, change the topic. Start talking about food. Food always works. Awesome, food saves the day. It does. <laughs> it really does. All right, let's move on to another mechanics deep dive, and this time let's talk about the drop mechanic. So drop rates, I'm going to admit, are something I have not dug into much personally at all. We had a staff member early in the game that did a lot of data collecting and putting together infographs for drop drop rates uh, by the name of Poseidon. Uh, He lived in the Philippines. And then over the summer, tragically, he died in a car accident. And since that time, no one on the staff has has really wanted to touch drop rates with with a 10-foot pole. Like, no. (laughs) We're going to try to avoid that. But I think you've done a fair amount of work with with drop rates. So 
let's uh have you give us an overview what what is drop rates and how do they work yeah so um I will, I will preface all of this by saying all of this is, is sort of empiric research. So I have no privileged knowledge here. Uh, some of this may be entirely incorrect. This is all just from the best of my, my abilities to divine uh, as a player. I wrote a system to basically record every drop I get out of the game um, so that I can do a large amount of data analysis. Um, and the way the system seems to work uh, breaks down pretty simply. So for standard exploring, uh, every zone, every location has has a base drop rate. Um, those are different between the zones. A lot of them are one in three, but there's some fancier ones. Uh, I think like uh, Whispering Creek appears to be about four out of 15 explorers uh, will give you a drop. The other ones will give you no drops. Um, for actually picking, once you get a drop, picking what item will actually drop. So that's the same between exploring, cider, lemonade, um, and for fishing, it's the same between regular fishing and nets, aside from the, the goldfish, which don't work with nets. But the, the rates appear to be entirely the same, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, I can't quite tell how the drop system works internally, but I have gathered all of the sort of percentages. Um, so... Once you have, once you've rolled, you know, if you get that four out of fifteen at, at Whispering Creek, then it will pick one of the items based on a big weighted table. I'm guessing, um, and then uh, that's the item you get. Uh, when you use uh, lemonade, it gives you either uh, ten or twenty. It just rolls them, so it's not there's no there's no base drop rate calculation there because you're getting ten or twenty items no matter what. But it's the same uh, picking. It's the same weighted table for picking the items, as far as I can tell. Yeah, that it is, and I've, I've, we've had that confirmed from Firestream in the past that the weighted items is the same regardless of the method that you pick them up. All the better. So in-game, we have just a, a rarity list of, I think, common, rare, uncommon, your basic ones, but doesn't tell us a whole lot more than that. Um, are all commons roughly the same and all uncommons roughly the same in their drop rate? As best I can tell, those are related to the weights in the, the sort of weighted table that produces the final drops. They appear to be only loosely related because there's things that are both common that have fairly different drop rates, and there may be some items that just have a sort of manual override there. I can't really tell. You know, if if, uh, if Firestream wants to just say this is a a rare item, but it's you know it's this, they're similar to an uncommon, it gets to be a little hard to tell exactly how those work. But they do appear to be roughly correlated with the overall drop rates. So in a particular zone, if Say I'm looking for something specific. So say with the Valentine's event, all of a sudden everyone was looking for fish bones that you can fish out of four different areas and then feathers that you can get out of two different areas. How do you pick which one's going to give you or how do you other than doing the doing some investigation, figuring out what would you do to kind of determine which one is probably going to give you the better chance of picking up those items? So my best guess on, on how the system works internally and my apologies to Firestream if I am way off base uh, is that. It's it's sort of a, a, a weighted choice. So you can imagine like a common. So you've got just a big a big like a big bar, and a common takes up more percentage of the bar, and a rare takes up less percentage of the bar. And you're just you know throwing a dart somewhere along the number line, and wherever it hits, that's the item you get. And so if there's more commons in the area, that'll sort of dilute. You know the commons will dilute each other. They'll dilute all the other items. Um, so if you're looking for a specific item, you want to find the the location with as few other common drops or, you know, drops, you know, the, the weighting times how much you want the item. You want as few other stuff as possible. Um, so feathers, feathers has been sort of a, a popular question lately, uh, again, for obvious reasons with the uh, with the Valentine's event still ongoing. Let me I can grab the the actual rates for those. Um, so feathers drop in two places, Highland Hills and Small Spring. Um, so I know empirically, uh, in Small Spring, they drop uh, 11.48 explorers per drop, and Highland Hills, it's 20.44 explorers per drop. And the base drop rates, I can grab those. So the base drop rate for Small Spring is one out of three, and Highland Hills is one out of four. So drops... Drops are just less common at Highland Hills overall, um, so that that automatically makes Highland Hills probably worse. Mm -hmm. But even within that, if we go look in-game, Small Spring has how many? So 
some of, some of these don't even have like wood does not have a listed uh, rarity. Mm-hmm. I assume wood is extremely common. Aquamarine feathers. Feathers actually also don't have a listed rarity, so maybe I chose a, a bad example. But I think like making an educated guess, probably uh, six of the drops at Small Spring are commons mm-hmm. versus. Let's go look at Highland Hills. I think it looks like about seven of them at Highland Hills are commons. Oh uh, no, probably about six. So it's probably about the same. So for feathers, it probably comes down to. Uh, the base drop rate of Highland Hills is worse. Mm-hmm. And probably there's a few slightly more common drops at Highland Hills. So Small Spring ends up being a better a better choice. It's about twice as good for feathers. I think uh, whenever you have the choice to to go to Small Springs versus any other area for common drops, the fact that it drops apples makes it a little bit tempting as well. That that does help. I, I, I tend to ignore that in a lot of my data because it would make things super complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's something like you get uh, one per yeah, it's about one per ni- one apple per ninety explores in Small Spring. So you get out of out of every out of every ninety explores, you will get whatever. If depending on uh, depending on your perks, you'll get about fifteen explores back. If you've got Wanderer perks, you'll get a little more. Um, so for if you have full Wanderer for every ninety explores, you'll get twenty two back. So how do we compare for since we're talking about apples, apples? Yeah, apples also drop in uh, Whispering Creek. Mm -hmm. Which one has a higher apple drop rate? Uh, Whispering Creek, apples 76 explorers per drop versus Small Springs 90. All right, there we go. So if you want apples, Whispering Creek's better better spot to go. Yep, and see, that's that's kind of a little bit non-intuitive. So uh, the the base drop rate at Whispering Creek is better. It's four four out of 15. which is right about uh, one out of, no, I guess, uh, wait, am I doing doing that wrong? No, it's worse. The base drop rate of Whispering Creek is worse. That's about one out of four versus Small Spring, which is one out of three. Uh, so it means that the there are not a lot of other common drops at Whispering Creek, which makes sense because I think there's just probably the oranges, I think are the only other common drop there and Slimestone maybe. Yeah, oranges are listed as uncommon. So fewer. As are lemons. Yep, so not even oranges. So probably just slimestone and uh, oh, blue gel i think is a common yeah assuming that apples are relatively common because we can't tell from the uh, the item details so yeah so there's only three common drops at whispering creek as opposed to the six at small spring therefore whispering creek gets to be a little better on average yeah even though the base drop rate is a little bit a little bit lower in whispering creek yeah so that's that's why it's not quite as much better as like it's not twice as good even though there's half as many common drops um and like I said, I think the the common, uncommon, rare, etc., are pretty broad categories because you can see two common drops that have pretty different drop rates. Uh, so I'm not totally clear on exactly how big those those bounds are. Awesome. Well, thank you for your input. That's that's cool to know. A lot of this I just kind of have a, a fill for after having played the game a lot, but you don't actually know the numbers. And uh, if it makes you feel any better, even even Firestream, when he talks about it, you know, it's like he sets a drop rate, but, but the way that it gets aggregated in with every other item there, he was at one point thinking of writing a system on the back end to track drops to give actual drop rate numbers <laughs> because he couldn't figure out what they actually were <laughs> otherwise. It's, uh, yeah, that's why, that's why I wrote my, my data collection system. Otherwise, it seems like it would be completely impossible. All right. Well, thank you for doing this uh, deep dive on drop mechanics for us. That was some really good information. And certainly uh, some things I wasn't aware of. I, I wasn't really aware of the different base drop rates for the areas. That's a, a recent research development. So late breaking news for your listeners. 